Uh, my name is Clayton Corver. I'm on staff here, and I'm just all around excited about this morning. Um, let's see here. This is the second last teaching in our uh, Proverbs series. Uh, it's been called Summer Wise. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been really fun. I, I tell you, I saw Andrew the other day. I've been drawn back to his first sermon for a long time now. I keep sitting with it. If you want to see it, you can go back and watch it online. But his topic was the fear of the Lord. And he's talked about it at length. And what stuck out to me was I'd always heard the fear of the Lord was awe and reverence and respect. And he says it is all those things. But it, what if it's more? And that was just, that was thought provoking. It struck me. He wondered if maybe if a, it's actually a healthy fear of how big God is, how powerful God is, how wonderful he is. And I just began to think, if that is how I actually see him, does that change the way I view I wrote all this down, my problems, my pain, my suffering, but even my hopes and my dreams, my expectations, our relationships, when sickness and death come, if God is that big, does that change the way I view everything? So I've been thinking about that. And then secondly, I was uh, uh, in, a, in a, uh, a study this summer, and uh, uh, it led me to a topic I thought I was going to talk about today. And I was really excited about it. I think it's a good topic. But our topic today is speech. It's not what I thought it was going to be. And what happened was um, I had this topic, and I shared a story with, there is a reason for this story before we actually talk about the Proverbs we're going to talk about today. Um, Because I think I've done this before. I wonder if some of us wrestle with the same thing. So I had this idea. It was a good idea. But I was trying to get ready for this sermon. I was trying to find Proverbs that matched what I had been thinking about. And so um, I was telling somebody about that as I was getting ready, and they said, oh, no, don't do that. Well, it wasn't like a sincere, it it was a laugh. They chuckled. They said, oh, no, don't do that. And when they said that, I remembered something I had read a long time ago, or two years ago. Eugene Peterson, some people read the Message Bible. He said this. He said, we need to read the Bible as it comes to us, not in the way that we come to it. Does that make sense to everybody? So what I was doing was I was coming to the Proverbs with something that I was thinking about, something that I wanted to say. And it was a good thing, but I was not allowing the words to speak to me. I was not allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to me. I had a, a preconceived idea. And so I see this play out often, where I have an opinion or a side to an issue, and what I'm doing is I'll go and look in this book, and I'll find a text that seems to match up with what I think, and then I'll use it. But when I do that, I don't, look at, I don't think about things like context, like what was going on in the story. I don't think about uh, what was the writer trying to accomplish. The writer is always the Holy Spirit through people. Um, uh, I just kind of copy and paste the text into my thought, and that struck me. It was convicting for me. And so rather than allowing the words to speak to me, to correct me, to change me, I try to kind of change the words, essentially, into what I would like for them to say. And so the, I think the Holy Spirit intervened this past week. And uh, through the kind words of someone, I scrapped what I had and I started over. And we end up on speech. And I, it was funny, as I was getting ready, uh, I, I thought of this. A trusted and respected second opinion is a good thing. Uh, Proverbs 18.17 says, the first person to present his case seems right. Till another comes forward and questions him. So someone questioned me. It was a good question. And it made me think. And I went back to the words, and I felt like the words came back to me. So then through some conversations, I think it was confirmed. We're going to talk about speech today. And so what I've been thinking about for about the past week and a half now is just this statement. I think we have a slide. It's just, am I, are you aware of the weight of my words? I mean, am I actually aware of the weight of my words? I have heard this before. I think my mom, my mom used to tell me, if you, don't have any, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. So I've been told this before my entire life. But I don't know that I actually am aware. So I think our task today is actually kind of a tall one. It's something we've all heard, something we all know, but I've been struck by, I don't know if I'm actually aware of the weight of all my words. So, uh, I wrote down, am I aware of the power of words, like fat or stupid or incompetent? But on the flip side, am I also aware of the power of telling someone that you're wonderful, you're terrific, you did a great job? Do I, am I actually aware of the power? In uh, Proverbs 18, 20, 18, 21, it says, the tongue has the power of life and death. And I started thinking about that for a while. Life and death. Words, my words, have the power of life and death. That's a striking thing to actually think about for a while. Because I talk a lot, lots of words. But my words can create life or create death. So today is not just about our own words. 
We're going to look at it a little bit differently. Uh, we're going to look at the words that are spoken to us and how we receive those words. Then we're going to think about the words that we actually speak. And then we're going to think about the words that we could speak. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. All right? So our verses for today, um, you can pull them up. Proverbs 12, 1 is first. Yep. I'm going to, I like reading out of the Bible here. So whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. It kind of makes me chuckle every time I read it. So my question, though, is, I used to be an athlete, is are, are, are you coachable? Am I coachable? Am I willing to receive others' words? Our next one we're going to work through. Um, Proverbs 12, 18. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. So my question is pretty simple. Your words are, contain life or death, so do my words kill? Do they pierce like a sword, or do my words heal? So we're going to talk about that a little bit. And then we're going to close. This is my emphasis I think for today is anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. So we, our words of blessing, if we choose to speak them, can lift someone up. So my wondering has been, am I choosing to speak them? When I hear a word, do I share it? So that's where we're going to go today. One final thought before we do. Um, this past week, my wonderful and amazing wife shared a podcast with me because she knew what I was going to talk about. And uh, I know that I'm biased, but I think I'm right. My wife's the best. Uh, in, the po- in the podcast, the speaker talked at length about a word, and the word was honor. It's not a word I don't use very often. I don't think we as a culture use the word very often. And so from what I understand, I'm, I was, I'm new to this, I'm trying to understand the word, but to summarize, honor is where we recognize someone's value. It's where we assign value. It's where we give value. So I'm trying to think about that through speech, because usually we show honor through our words, through speech, because the person can receive it. So I kind of want that to be kind of the way we think about this today. So as we receive words, as we speak words, and think about what we speak, do we honor one another? Do we assign true, do we give true value? Do we see people? Or do we dishonor them? Do we speak untrue values? Do we speak false values over them? So Paul, in one of his letters, says that uh, as followers of Jesus, we are to honor one another above ourselves. So another translation said we're supposed to outdo one another in showing honor. So let's think about that today. As we think about our words, do we honor one another or do we dishonor one another? All right. Words. Here we go. We're starting with 12.1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. So are you coachable? Uh, I was telling Kelly about this. And she said, well, how, what, what does coachability have to do with speech? So let me explain. Now remember, we're not just talking about our own words. We're talking about kind of, I wrote down all the words. I'll say it in a minute. But I, I think the writer of Proverbs, think it's really important how we receive words. Uh, it seems to shape probably our futures. It shapes how we speak to each other. So how we receive words matters. So think of a good conversation you're part of recently or watched. I watched a good one the other day where both sides, they talked but they listened to each other. They uh, made room for the other to speak and didn't respond quickly. And then I've seen other conversations where it seems like both sides just get louder and louder and louder as they try to reinforce their point to where both sides end up just leaving angry. So in, the, in, the, in those conversations, so to me, there are three good things in a, uh, that make a good conversation. First is questions. Second is listening. And third is humility. So a question opens up the conversation. It allows it to continue. Second, to ask a good question, you have to listen to know what to ask. And then third, humility allows you to recognize that you might not always be right. I am oftentimes not right. So I've been learning to sit in humility as I'm in conversation. So the Proverbs, I learned this, they think was maybe kind of a a curriculum of sorts for, they think, some scholars think this, for up-and-coming leaders in Israel in their golden age. So when I think about 12.1 in that way, I almost see this as like an entrance exam question as you're coming in to maybe become a leader in Israel, do you like to be corrected? If you don't, you probably didn't make the program, right? So um, once upon a time, I was an athlete. uh, And I was told at a young age that I would probably not be the best athlete. I'd be an okay athlete, but I wouldn't be the best. So if I wanted to play, I had to be coachable. I had to be able to receive my coach's advice to get better. And so I found when I start from that position, I think my coaches enjoyed coaching me. I found that their, their coaching was oftentimes encouraging. There was kind of a, a back and forth, a give and take, and they would, they'd recognize how I was improving, they would recognize what I was doing better, but they said, but you could also do this. This would be good to do. Work on this. But they would, it was just this beautiful relationship. 
So I played basketball in college for a guy named Dr. Tom Davis. I'm not sure if anybody knows who he is. He was coached at Iowa a couple years ago. Um, when I was growing up, everyone wanted to play for Dr. Tom. So I grew up in Pella. We didn't have many Iowa State fans in Pella. I think that would have been Coach Orr at that time probably. But uh, I remember racing home from cadets. Anybody else be a part of cadets? Now, I think I see one or two hands. Perfect, cadets, so no one knows what it is. It was a church program, but it was on Wednesday nights, and I would race home trying to catch the second half of the Iowa, whoever they were playing. So I watched guys like Kenyon Murray and Jess Settles and A.C. Earl and all those guys. Um, anyways, I got to play for Coach at Drake uh, about 10 years ago now. And one time when I was playing for him, I was, at, uh, I was really struggling from the free throw line, just missing shots. I'm, I was an okay free throw shooter. But I was in the gym working on it. And in the gym, there was our locker room, there was a hoop, and the far side was where Coach always walked through. I saw him walk through, and he stopped, and he walked over and watched me. Now, for those of you who don't know, when you shoot a basketball, generally the, foot you're, the hand you shoot with is the foot that's forward. So if you're right hand, your right foot's forward. If you're left hand, your left foot's forward. So I was struggling. Coach walks up. He watches me for a couple minutes, and he says to me, what if you put your left foot forward? I was like, what? I have never seen someone do that. Never. I've seen people stand back from the line. I've seen different stuff. I've never seen people switch their feet. But he was coached. He was very famous. He was, I think, top 10 wins all time. So I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. So I'm sitting there with my left foot forward awkwardly trying to figure it out. And he just leaves. And so I tried for quite a while. And uh, I was having a hard time with it. Next day, he's walking back through again. There I am trying to figure it out again. And he comes back. And he stops. And he walks over and sees me and goes, just switch back. And I was like... <laughs> What? I remember telling teammates, coach told me to put my left foot forward. And they're like, no one does that. I said, I know. So, but lo and behold, I switched back. I started making free throws. So I was thinking about this. I don't know why coach did that to me. But I think he knew that I was stuck. And I couldn't get myself out of my slump. And I was trying harder and harder and harder. But I was sinking deeper and deeper and deeper into this slump. I was stuck in my head. I couldn't get out. So he shocked me with an idea that I thought was just absurd. I thought it was stupid. I think sometimes correction can seem stupid to the one being corrected. It may not make sense in the moment, but maybe sometimes we're too tied up in the moment to actually see what we're doing wrong. Maybe we're too tied up in something that's destructive, something sinful, but it's a pattern now we can't get out. So correction might seem stupid, but it is a beautiful thing. We need fresh eyes, fresh perspectives. So... That's my question. Are we coachable? But I had one thing. I wrote a warning to the coaches, and it's not just coaches, uh, because we're all coaches, and we're all correcting, we're all speaking, we're all telling people how to do things better or to improve. I heard this a long time ago, and I I wrote it down. I thought it worked for today. I think we have a slide for it. Um, It says, truth, this is as as we choose to speak, as we choose to coach, truth without love is brutality, but love without truth is hypocrisy. So I just, do you hear the tension in the statement? As before you choose to speak, before you choose to correct, before I do, truth without love is brutality, but love without truth is hypocrisy. So this book tells us we're supposed to speak the truth, and we are. But without love, which is the will of the good of another, it's not my will, it's his will. To, without love, without compassion, without the Holy Spirit, the truth can brutally wound. Then the flip side, If I choose not to speak the truth under the pretense of love, well, then I'm a hypocrite. So I may know the right things. I might know what someone should do. But if it just resides up here, and it's really important that we know the right stuff up here, but if we don't see any of it in our lives or in our speech, I begin to think to myself, what is it that I really believe in? If I won't do it, if I won't speak it, what do I believe in? So our words are important. We have to be aware of the weight of our words, which takes us to our next proverb. Proverbs 12, 18. Reckless words pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. So do your words kill or do they heal? I mean, remember the tongue speaks, it's life or death. So as I sat reading this, the first word that stood out to me was just reckless. For someone to be reckless, you oftentimes act without thinking or caring about the consequences of that action. So in regards to language, it's a reckless word. Do I, do I care about what happens after I speak it or do I just speak it? Um, and what I was struck by, and I'm just going to keep trying to drive this home because I think it's something we've all thought about, is that all of our words matter. Every single word matters. So there are so many Proverbs, things in the Bible about being slow to speak. I think there's a reason why we're supposed to be slow to speak. Because every single word matters. I heard this line said recently that people live up to, let me slide four, I think, 
or live down to the words that we speak over them. So people live up to or live down to the words that we speak over them. The person went on to tell a story who said that quote. They said they heard some parents saying their small child was a little devil. To which he wanted to respond, I bet. You've been saying that to him his whole life. What do you expect? That just struck me. How many times have I done that? Said things to people and then see it play out and then get mad at them for it. I see it in social media all the time. And I've been struck by the thought, I I don't think that most times we're trying to be mean-spirited. I don't think. But we're trying to solicit a laugh or sympathy or on social media. It's a like something. Want someone to see us. But I just can't. Is it worth it? That's what I keep thinking. Is a reckless, quick word to draw a laugh worth it? Uh, in my house, like I said, my mom, you have nothing nice to say. Don't say anything at all. We need to say hard things, but we need to think about it before we say it. So I think each of us could think of someone we know, and maybe it might be yourself, who have had something said over, to us, said over us over and over and over again. The thing is, if an untrue thing gets said enough times, we begin to believe it is truth. We begin to believe that, oh, that is who I am. That is what I am. So words like stubborn or difficult or not like so-and-so or a failure, never live up to their potential, unlovable, unattractive, not good enough, these words spoken in sarcasm or in anger, they just stick to us. And then they slowly become true because we begin to believe them. So we talked about being a people who honor each other earlier with our words. That is dishonoring. I think a great example of of wanting to see the weight of words spoken over somebody, just go to a sporting event this fall and just watch as people are either, as either harsh words are spoken over a, 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 a young athlete or encouraging words. And just watch their bodies. Just watch what happens. So on the flip side, so if we, could, we can dishonor with our words, we can also honor. So what an opportunity we have with every single word we speak. We speak a lot. I, actually, I didn't look it up. I wonder how many words we speak in a day. That's how many opportunities we have to bless somebody, to honor somebody, to lift them up, which transitions us to the, oh, and one final thought. Uh, I was talking to Matt about this. Matt Matt Vincent gives me a good little nugget every single time I'm going to do something. That guy, he's wise. So he was at a conference, and he said, uh, he heard someone say, when you think of something nice, just do it. When you think of something nice to say, say it. I think oftentimes we think people know how we feel. I don't know if they do. If I'm a sarcastic person, I don't know if they will. So if you think of something nice to say, say it. Let's transition us to our final proverb. And this is where we're going to send out uh, an anxious heart. Um, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. Um, I have a different translation. Anxiety in someone's mind weighs it down, but a good word makes it the mind rejoice. So my wondering for myself and for you is we get ideas of words of blessing or words of encouragement. And my question is, do we choose to speak them? Do we say them out loud? We're supposed to be people full of good words. Uh, Proverbs 16.24 says, Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. So gracious words heal our most innermost places. But they also can heal our body. Just ask, I was thinking about the Weldons. How good is local honey for you, for your immune system? It's a wonderful thing for you. Words the same way. It, 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 it impacts our minds and our hearts, but it impacts our physical bodies, I think, as well. If you've seen somebody who just, who is harsh all the time, or someone who receives angry words or just words that cut them down, have you ever looked at them? I feel like they kind of hunch. It's like they're wearing something on their back. Versus then that means gracious words can pick someone's shoulders up and brighten their eyes and put a smile on their face and a spring in their step. I think that words are just, I've been just struck by the weight of all of my words as I've been preparing. There's another proverb that says that a generous man or woman will prosper. He who refreshes others, he or she who refreshes others will themselves be refreshed. So the one who receives the kind words is refreshed, but the person who says them is also refreshed. Isn't that amazing? Words, life and death are so powerful. I've been struck by it. So what does this look like in our lives? Um, Two things. And then we'll be done. I think the first thing we have to do uh, is recognize where we've dishonored others before then we can honor others. I, uh, in my life, historically, I don't think I've thought a lot about confession or enough about confession. And what I've been struck by is re- more recently, 
when I, when I wrong somebody, if I say I'm sorry, would you forgive me? I've noticed that it changes how I act in the future. So the next time I go to do something, I think, oh, no, don't do that. Don't say that. So what I want to do here first is as a church body, I'm going to make an assumption today, and that's that we all said something harsh to someone last week. We injured someone with our words. I did. Maybe you didn't. I did. I would love it if all of us, I think as I'm talking right now, someone's going to come to your mind who you were harsh with this week, someone that you dishonored this week, someone's coming to my mind. I like to, as a church body, ask for forgiveness. I love to get right here so we can be right here first. Is that okay? So as I'm praying, someone comes to mind, seek forgiveness, and I'm going to encourage you afterwards, go find that person. Tell them you're sorry. Let's pray. Hmm. If I would say, we missed it this last week. Um, we used our words uh, harshly. We, used our, we, didn't, we didn't use them well. And so I just ask that in this moment that you would bring someone to each of our minds that we injured, someone that we need to, uh, uh, to seek forgiveness from or to refresh with our own words. And I say, we ask for forgiveness. We say thank you for your grace. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, that's the first part. Second part, I want to be a people who are encouraging all the time. So, we're getting ready for uh, Sunday on Tuesday, and we came in here and prayed for all, all of you on. I just had this, I was sitting there, I feel like God said to me, just don't think about yourself. I have people I want you to encourage. I have people I want you to, to pray for. So, that's what I want. So, we're going to move into a time of worship here in a moment. So, Ben, you guys can come on up. As this is happening, as the band's coming up, and as we move into worship, I think the Holy Spirit, while he brought up someone to your mind that, that we, that we wronged last week, I think he's also going to bring someone to your mind that you could encourage. Someone that he's asking you to encourage. He needs us to encourage that person. He would like for us to do that. And so in the worship time or afterwards, I say, please, 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 email them, text them, call them. It's best if you can deliver them face-to-face. Whatever you have to do, whoever you, whoever you think you could encourage this week, please encourage them. And then third, um, uh, which I didn't say third earlier, um, the song we're going to close with is called Who You Say I Am. And I, I like this song for a lot of reasons. But uh, what I love about it is that it's just, to me, it's full of humility. So it's, it's who God says I am. That's what this song is about. It's not who I say I am. It's not who someone else says who, that I am. And I just can't help but think that some of us have probably had a name or an identity placed on us in life that has been untrue. It's been dishonoring. It's been a false value. That is not who you are. That's not how you're seen. So just so you know, we have prayer ministers uh, here after church. And I, was, I would say again, please, 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 if that is you, come up and get prayed for. Our, our ministers love to pray prayers of, prayers of blessing, of, of real value, true value, how, how your heavenly Father sees you over you. Let's pray. I just ask that you would encourage us this week to be, what's, what's so amazing as followers of Jesus is that we get to become more and more and more like you each day. If we stay in step with you, if we ask you, um, you remake us. It's this wonderful, beautiful process. So I just pray this week that we would be a people of encouragement, that we'd be a people of blessing, of life-giving words, that we would be bold, that we'd be courageous, that as you prompt us, as you bring things to mind, that we just go say it. If we see someone as we pray for, we just go pray for them. Um, so I pray that over our congregation, just a spirit of courage. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.